this on. All right. Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, guests that are lucky enough to be here in person. And, and I know we have quite a lot of people uh, dialing in as well. So uh, you know, welcome to all of those people who aren't lucky enough to uh, enjoy a, a real life uh, um, sort of briefing session. And, and for them, it's just a webinar. Uh, my name is Michael Woods. Um, and together with Peter Marks, I run Newburyport Partners, which is a sort of small uh, advisory group for startup life sciences and, uh, and you know, other companies that are looking to either raise early stage pre-IPO um, or um, small uh, early stage listed, listed companies. Um, uh, so the session today is going to be uh, mainly a, a short presentation by two of uh, the most innovative companies uh, uh, presenting today. Um, and then there'll be a short Q&A after each one. People who are uh, dialing in uh, over, over the Zoom will have a chance to submit your Q&A via the, uh, the chat box. So please do that. And we'll, uh, we'll make sure we pick up those questions. So uh, first, first up is uh, Dimerix, um, developing a lead drug DMX200 for a rare uh, kidney, di kidney disease, FSGS. Uh, and there's currently no FDA approved therapies for that. Recruiting uh, phase three uh, with interim results expected the first half uh, 23. So there's also uh, multiple long-term opportunities for DBX200 uh, in other diseases such as diabetic kidney disease and a second uh, product, DBX700 for COPD. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Nina Webster, who's been with Dimerix for, well, since 2018 and has over 30 years experience in the pharmaceutical industry um, and a leadership of a variety of roles from investor relations, IP and product development. Prior to joining Dimerix, Nina was the commercial director at Acrux, an Australian pharmaceutical company and successfully developed and commercialized several different products uh, in that role. So I'll hand over to Nina. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I do apologize. I was very much looking forward to being there in person. Sadly, it was our turn this week and COVID has hit the house, uh, and all of us, including myself. So hopefully my voice is going to last for the, the session today. Um, but I look forward to taking any questions you have as well. So just noting our forward looking statements. Um, just for those who are not familiar with Dimerix, um, just a, a brief overview. Uh, we are a listed company based here in Melbourne. Um, we are developing a number of different therapies, predominantly in the inflammatory disease space, and leading that is the within the kidney and the respiratory space. Uh, we have a number of, of programs in late stage clinical development. The main one that I'm going to be focused on today is the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis in the kidney disease, the rare disease, and we'll touch more on that in just a moment. Just noting, you know, it's been a, a bit of a tumultuous couple of years for I think most uh, of the sectors globally but Dimerix has managed to hit a number of key milestones despite doing it all from our front rooms. I won't read these out in detail these are all available on our website but essentially we did manage to complete two phase two studies through 2020. Um, we've now progressed into a phase three study with our lead program FSGS. Our product was invited into two large global COVID studies uh, most recently, we have IND uh, approval for our F, uh, phase three study in the US, and we are opening over 75 sites across 12 different countries for that study. So very much looking forward to updating the market on that progress as well. But coming into kidney disease broadly, um, there are three key mechanisms uh, associated with sclerotic kidney disease. And sclerotic, we mean fibrotic or, or scarring. The first is this hyperfiltration or hypertension. And what happens is the kidney works really, really hard and it builds up a lot of pressure. That pressure uh, within the kidney that is persistent and ongoing causes point number two, which is inflammation. That inflammation within the cell, again, is ongoing and persistent and it causes uh, fibrosis or scarring within the, the kidney, uh, which leads to point number three, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> point number three, which is the loss of those specialized cells. Now you can imagine that as you lose these cells, you come back to point number one, there are now less cells to filter the blood. So they have to work even harder, causing more hypertension, hyperfiltration, which leads to more inflammation in point two, which leads to even more loss of those cells in point three. 
So as you come down the hill of, of kidney disease, as these cells uh, are lost, you go around this cycle faster and faster until you no longer have enough cells to filter the blood. And you end up in uh, end stage renal failure uh, and on dialysis and or transplant list. Now we know that the existing current standard of care uh, works on hypertension. It is an antihypertensive, uh, blocks what's called the AT1R receptor, it's an angiotensin receptor blocker. We also know that our drug, DMX200, blocks what's called a CCR2 receptor, and that's on the inflammatory pathway. But what is really important is how those two receptors work together. They're actually linked. And what we have identified is if you block one of those receptors without the other, you get not just a, a signal still coming through, but you get what's called upregulation. So think of a three lane motorway now becoming a five lane motorway for streaming of that traffic. And the reverse is true as well. If you block the second receptor, but not the first, you get this upregulation, more traffic coming through and the signal for this disease. And we identified quite early that you need to block both of these receptors at the same time to see the more complete response. Now, the exciting thing within this space is kidney disease has had very little innovation over the last probably 30 to 50 years and has a massive unmet need globally uh, and is one of the identified as one of the leading issues globally for um, healthcare at the moment. If we have a look at, again, the last two years since COVID started, <clears throat> how many licensing transactions have, have happened in the kidney space? This is a large number of transactions in a very short space of time. Now for reference um, in the green boxes, we talk about whether it's worldwide, whether it's regional, whether it's country, what stage is at phase one to phase three, and whether it's renal, whether it's multiple products. Now the darker the circle, the closer it is to the dimerics proposition. Now these are really, really quite exciting in this space. And you've got to think, well, why is all this activity happening in the kidney space? What's changed? There's been nothing for 30 to 50 years, and all of a sudden you see all of this interest in this space. The same goes for, for M&A. There's been a number of M&As happen, not least of which was the large CSL deal that we all heard about in December, just gone, uh, taking out the European company V4 that specializes in kidney disease. So why? What, what's happened? What's changed in this space? Well, Historically, there's been a lack of incentives to develop products in kidney disease, and there's been a lot of high cost um, that essentially kidney disease studies needed to go to what's called end stage renal failure, where the kidney actually fails and the patient goes on to dialysis. You can imagine this can take years. Uh, in some of those studies, it could be a 10 year plus study with thousands and thousands of patients, which is just not cost effective or practical, hence very little interest there. Um, what we've seen in the last couple of years is some real changes across both the FDA regulatory landscape, FDA, EMA, and MHRA, so it's been a global acceptance, as well as some more policy changing um, uh, activity in each of the countries as well. And we're gonna to touch on those today, but um, importantly, what we do is when we have a look at those is that's what's driving to where we are today and why there's such an exciting space within the kidney space. It's been noted that there's been more change in the last 24 months in kidney disease than there has in the last 24 years. And so that's, again, a, putting dimerics in a very, very interesting and exciting space. But policy change, what's happened in the policy change? In 2019, the White House um, issued an executive order uh, noting that kidney disease was one of the largest global, uh, uh, sorry, healthcare issues in the US. It was costing the US healthcare sector $88 billion a year, and $55 billion of that was in end-stage renal failure care. So the issue that the um, White House executive order that was issued is essentially anything that you can do to delay the patient's progress to renal failure. So we want to avoid getting on this chart of the $55 billion. So that was the first thing with policy change and the real interest with the healthcare providers, uh, uh, healthcare policymakers globally. The second thing was the regulatory change and what's moving towards something called surrogate endpoints. Now a surrogate endpoint is when you look at an interim outcome as a substitute for the final outcome. So the final outcome is kidney failure and you want to prevent that, but we look at markers that we can identify uh, that are uh, suggesting where you are on that progression. So pre-2018, we had these hard kidney endpoints that might last decades. In 2018, 
the FDA, EMA, and the National Kidney Foundation all met and uh, came to the conclusion that they should be looking at these um, biomarkers, these surrogate markers, such as protein in the urine, which I'll touch on again in just a moment, and glomerular filtration rate, which is essentially kidney function, me measuring kidney function, as endpoints as a substitute for end-stage renal failure. In 2019, the FDA actually published their findings on that and noted that they were willing to accept those as potential endpoints. In 2020, the, uh, the number of publications came out that demonstrated the support of that correlation between protein in the urine, glomerular filtration rate, and thirdly, the um, end-stage renal failure. So putting the links between those, uh, which was really important. And then in 2021, the FDA actually put their money where their mouth was and granted the first product based on protein in the urine as a surrogate endpoint instead of um, end-stage renal failure. So this is a really exciting time for Dimerics to be in a phase three clinical study in an area that has no unmet need uh, and no products approved specifically for FSGS anywhere in the world. So moving on to FSGS specifically, well, what is FSGS? We talked about kidney disease more broadly. FSGS means, focal means some, segmental means sections, glomerulo means of the ki filtering, kidney filtering units, and sclerosis is scarred. So essentially what we're saying is some sections of the kidney are scarred. Over time, more and more of those sections are scarred, uh, ending in, in those cells not being able to function and filter blood. It's a really rare disease. It affects children as young as two, two years old, as well as ad adults, sadly. And the prognosis is really poor. Uh, sadly, for those who are fortunate enough to get a, a kidney transplant, around 40% get reoccurring FSGS in the transplanted kidney, and nobody knows why. When we talk about protein in the urine as that surrogate marker, if we just jump onto this little um, bubbles on the right-hand side, healthy kidney should be effectively filtering the blood so you have no protein in the urine. And you, some of you may recall when you go to, to a doctor, if you have a, a, a health condition, you see the doctor, they'll often want to do a urine dipstick test. And what they're testing for is protein in the urine, which is a sign of, of certain illness, in particular kidney disease. What happens in kidney disease is the filter is not effective and you end up with these, these protein leaking into the urine. The more protein in the urine, the more leaky your kidneys, which means the greater your kidney damage is. So anything you can do to reduce that is, is a benefit to the patient. But touching on that unmet, unmet need again, uh, there's around 120,000, sorry, 210,000 people globally Around 40,000 are diagnosed in the US at the moment with FSGS. Um, and around 50% of those will progress to end-stage renal, renal failure in less than five years. So it's a really aggressive disease. And as I mentioned before, there'll be a large number that actually don't respond to, uh, to um, transplant either. Jumping into where that's brought us today, um, we, on the back of some very promising data in 2020, uh, moved into our phase three study in FSGS. This is a randomized, double-blind, multi-center, placebo-controlled study. It is being conducted globally in 12 different countries across approximately 70, 75 clinical sites. So it is a huge study. The way we've designed this study is, I mentioned before, patients are on the background of the current standard of care, the angiotensin receptor blocker. This makes it a much simpler process for us as well because we're not taking patients off a standard of care and ethically, that makes it a much simpler process because you're not removing a, a treatment that could prevent that kidney disease progression in the first instance. After a stabilization period, the patients are then randomized onto either DMX200 or placebo. Um, we are very fortunate that we've got a couple of different interim analysis points in this study. Well, the first one, the part one, is the first interim analysis that we will conduct after the first 72 patients, and that will confirm that what we saw in the phase two is what we're seeing in the phase three. We have a second part, which is part two, second analysis for accelerated approval. Because we have orphan drug designation in a rare disease, we're eligible for what's called accelerated approval, which means you can get marketing approval halfway through your study. So you could go to market halfway through here with 144 patients, and in the background, you carry on to the final analysis, which is the EGFR or the kidney function. 
In 2021, we were very fortunate that we conducted a um, capital raise. The capital raise structure was such that we raised sufficient to get us uh, to the part one analysis in the first instance. But we also did that raise with attaching options such that if we see success at that interim analysis, those options would expire four weeks later and would then convert and fund the second part through to accelerated approval. Essentially, we've managed to do a full funding for the phase three study right through. I mentioned before the study locations, you can see here it is a truly global study. We have all of our approvals in the majority of these countries. USA was uh, the most recent that we announced with the IND opening for the phase three study uh, just a, a week and a half ago, uh, which has been very exciting because that also confirms that our non-clinical package and our manufacturing package are appropriate for marketing approval, which the FDA had already commented on and suggested was, was the case. And now they have also confirmed that it, that is still the case. The first interim analysis we'd expect in the first half of 2023. So for a biotech company in a phase three study, that's a relatively near-term proposition. Ultimately, what is our plan? Well, our plan is um, to, to partner the product. We are not a company that is, uh, has a global presence at this stage. We'll never say never, but at this time, we have no plans to build a sales and marketing force. And so one of the things that we focus on at the moment is those partnering meetings, meeting with a variety of different uh, mid and large pharma companies globally, uh, discussing the, the um, DMX200 proposition. And ultimately what we're looking for is an outcome that maximizes the value for our shareholders at the appropriate time. So that's a snapshot of the presentation today. Um, just as a, a, a final uh, summary, uh, we do at the end of the last quarter have 16.8 million in cash sufficient to take us through to the uh, part one analysis of that study. Um, we also uh, have a number of shareholders in the top 10 that have been there for a number of years, so very stable. And we look forward to reporting on that phase three outcome in the very near future. I'd be very happy to take any questions. Really has, uh, and if if people from uh, from the uh, the webinar wish to submit their questions to the chat, uh, we'll pick them up. Um, thanks, Lena. Uh, my question is: You mentioned that you've got options um, to hopefully fund the second part of your study. Um, what about if your study is delayed by that four weeks? what will you do in that case? So the way that those options are structured um, and the way that's required by the ASX is we actually do have a fixed expiry date, which is in 2024. And what we've put in there is what's called an accelerated trigger event. And so what that means is that at whatever point we announce that data, the uh, options will expire four weeks later, 20, 20 ASX business days. Okay, thanks. And well, the second part of the study cost about the same as the first, so I'm guessing 15 mil? Uh, it's approximately 24 mil, so 24 mil for the first and 24 mil for the second, and that's hence, if you do the maths on, on the two that we did, that gets us um, the 24 for the second part as well. All right, thank you. Those options, uh, the exercise pricing Presumably, they'll only be exercised if the uh, exercise price is less than the share price. So, uh, or is there something else that uh, that's in the pricing there that helps you have the confidence that they will be exercised? Yeah, it's an excellent question, and uh, that's where it's really important to have multiple um, shots on goal, so to speak. So, we do have other programs in at the moment, not least of which the two COVID studies that are run by the investigator-led um, experts globally. We also have our DMX 700 program in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease that we expect to announce in June. So that's very near term as well. And we hope to move towards phase one at the end of this year, as well as um, we're looking to, to progress the diabetic kidney disease program uh, in the very near future as well. All right. Any other questions from the floor or, uh, or from the, uh, the audience? 
All right, I might ask one last question, if I may, Nina, um, and then uh, and then we'll move on to the next one. Um, I think I noticed uh, you've recruited your first patient um, into the into the study. I think it was announced yesterday. Um, is uh, in what country was that patient, and does that indicate um, that you know the uh, there's any expectation on how quickly you'll be able to recruit your first 72 patients, which is obviously required before you can start the clock ticking for that uh, interim uh, data analysis? Yes, it's a very good question because, of course, it's not the first patient that, that is relevant. It's the 72nd patient that dictates the timeline for data coming out as well. Um, the, the patient that was recruited uh, and announced yesterday was actually in Argentina, but it was actually a race between the countries because there's several that had patients coming in this week. Um, one of the things that we're very fortunate is having a global company called IQVIA, it's the largest CRO in the world, uh, that have people on the ground in each of those countries. We have sites activated in each of those countries. So the first half of this year has been predominantly focused on making sure those sites get up and running so that when we start activating and, and actually recruiting, we can move very, very quickly. Excellent. All right. Any other last questions before we move on? Oh, Nina, whilst you pointed out that there's been a lot of activity in the area, what do you feel the prospects of you getting um, potentially partnering arrangements in place even prior to the options needing to be exercised? Because obviously, if shareholders are asked to put more money in, um, that's always less palatable than often uh, an arrangement with a big farmer. Yes, yeah, so of course the options won't cost the, the shareholders any more. They're, they're already allocated. Um, but to that point, ultimately it comes down to uh, who the partner is and what they're putting on the table as to when that transaction could happen. Um, our goal is to make sure that we get the best return for our investors, uh, making sure that the partner that we're talking to has the right um, capabilities and attributes to take this product right through to market uh, on our behalf, representing both whether that's global, whether that's territory, depends again on the partner and their capabilities. So we look forward to, to updating the market on that in due course as well. All right. Thank you very much, Nina. You, uh, you held on well for COVID uh, suffering uh, uh, situation there. But, uh, I'll no. go find the strepsils now. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I think now we can uh, move on to, um, to the next presentation, which is Avita Medical. Um, so, um, and obviously, uh, as we go through, don't have to wait till the end to submit questions. Uh, feel free to submit them during the course of, of the presentation so that we can collate them at the end. Um, Avita is a uh, regenerative medicine company with a technology platform revolutionizing uh, medical skin restoration. The first uh, program is Recell, a uh, FDA approved system to, acute, to treat acute full thickness burns in patients age one month and up. Um, enrollment has also started for a complete stable vertiligo and soft tissue reconstruction. Top line results expected in the second half of this year with a commercial launch early next year. Dr. Mike Perry is CEO and has been since 2017 after serving on the board uh, since 2013. He's got extensive global pharmaceutical experience across a diverse range of therapeutic areas uh, with substantial experience in cell therapies and cell regenerative, cell-based gene therapies. Throughout his career, he's been and, and led significant and successful business development, commercial launch of over 30 products, 14 of which have achieved blockbuster status. Prior to his role at Avita, Mike was the Chief Scientific Officer of Novartis's Cell and Gene Therapy Unit from 2014 and 2017. And we're fortunate to have Mike here in the room with us. So uh, I'll hand over to Mike to, uh, to lead the next presentation. Thank you, Michael, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, legal disclaimers, you can read the uh, fine print later. Um, so let me tell you a little bit uh, about Avita Medical and uh, about uh, our product, Resell. 
uh, Resell is uh, approved in the United States for thermal burns at this time. Uh, we have two pivotal trials ongoing, uh, one in traumatic wounds, um, soft tissue reconstruction, and uh, a second one in vitiligo, uh, vitiligo being the autoimmune disease probably made famous by Michael Jackson, um, where one has uh, white patches of skin and um, it's basically the immune system of the individual that uh, is uh, causing their uh, melanocytes to not uh, secrete the, the melanin pigment um, or actually, um, actually killing those cells. Uh, once that, uh, from, from for vitiligo, once the disease is stable and not progressing, uh, we uh, will be, uh, assuming approval, uh, the first treatment uh, that can repigment uh, vitiligo lesions. Um, here on this introductory slide, uh, what you're seeing and so far as the, the picture on the right-hand side is um, a child who had uh, scald burn uh, on his uh, chest and stomach area, and uh, he was treated with Resell and uh, you can see pretty much scarless healing. Um, so how, how does resell work? Um, if you direct your attention to the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see at the um, figure uh, of a patient uh, right at the fingertips, you'll see a, a little yellow ball. Uh, that's meant to be a biopsy of healthy skin cells from the patient. Um, it's then uh, moving counterclockwise. It's then put through the recell device. The recell device has a proprietary enzyme buffer um, as well as a filtering step. Um, 25 minutes at the patient's bedside and uh, one has spray-on skin cells that are autologous. Uh, from the patient back to the patient. Uh, they're basically disaggregated. Uh, so the extracellular matrix has been digested and um, they can cover 80, 80 times the surface area of the original biopsy. So one square centimeter biopsy will cover 80 square centimeters of burn or wound. Um, as I mentioned, if you look on the right-hand side, many indications. Uh, for this platform technology, uh, vitiligo trial ongoing, trauma trial ongoing, and uh, burns uh, approved, chronic wounds, pilot data, and, uh, and so on. Um, we've uh, had a, a number of uh, value creation milestones that uh, we passed uh, during COVID. They're uh, enumerated on the left-hand side. I won't go through them here uh, for, for time, uh, but uh, this presentation is on our website. Uh, if you'd uh, like to, to view it there, abinamedical.com. On the right-hand side, some projected milestones that are upcoming. Uh, number one, uh, our new ease of use device. We have launched that device uh, very recently. We gained FDA approval of it um, earlier this year. And um, what it does is it reduces the number of steps by 30% in creating the resale spray on skin suspension. Um, and it is uh, a lot, as, as named, easier to use. Um, we, had, uh, we, we will next have, uh, in the second half of this year, um, FDA meetings uh, regarding IND enabling trials for both epidermal lysis villosa and rejuvenation. I'll tell you about those programs uh, in, a, in a moment. Uh, we um, achieved our, our, our partner in Japan, uh, Cosmatech, uh, achieved uh, PMDA approval. So the Japanese health authorities approved the resell for burns in Japan. Um, they are now awaiting the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare uh, to assign reimbursement. And uh, when they do, uh, they will launch in Japan 
and uh, we will be getting 40% of the reimbursed price. They will be uh, paying for all the sales and marketing in the region. Um, we have um, top line results um, coming out for both our vitiligo pivotal trial, as well as our soft tissue trauma pivotal trial, um, probably um, in the early part of the fourth quarter of this year. And um, we intend to file two PMAs, uh, one for each of those indications before the end of the calendar year and anticipate approval of both of those indications uh, by uh, next year's second half. Development pipeline, um, here you can see for, for a company of uh, 115 people, uh, we're doing quite a bit. Uh, we've got acute thermal burns approved in the United States. Um, we have that approval in Japan. <coughs> Uh, we have uh, vitiligo and uh, traumatic uh, soft tissue reconstruction, um, both uh, in pivotal trials, uh, which um, if um, successful, uh, they're very de-risked and highly powered. Uh, so we do anticipate success <laughs> and uh, those uh, will be hopefully approved in the second half of next year and uh, we'll be able to launch them at that point. Uh, we have two cell and gene therapy programs ongoing, uh, one in epidermolysis bullosa and another in rejuvenation. Uh, epidermolysis bullosa is a disease of the skin where the upper layer of the skin, the epidermis, is not appropriately attached to the dermal layer, the under, uh, below the epidermis. Um, the problem there is a single gene mutation. Uh, it's uh, collagen uh, 7A1, and um, that's uh, relatively easily fixed through gene editing tools. Um, the innovation that we're bringing is that uh, we have proven proof of concept that you can take these genetically modified skin cells, put them in our solution, and grow normal skin on the back of a, a nude mouse. Uh, so it's an immunocompromised mouse. So it doesn't reject the human skin. Um, in rejuvenation, uh, we've also hit proof of concept um, at the end of the last calendar year. And uh, that uh, is using RNA telomerase to biologically reverse age the skin cells and have them start expressing collagen and elastin as though they're very young skin cells. So skin samples that have been taken from 55, 60 year old patients uh, and following transduction with mRNA telomerase behaving like they're five or six years of age. Um, new ease of use device, which I just mentioned. And uh, we're working on uh, another device that will be fully automated. Uh, that we anticipate will be ready for our vitiligo launch. And um, that's where uh, it'll be a different call point uh, instead of the hospital where burns and soft tissue trauma are presenting. Uh, this will be a procedure that's done in the dermatologist's office and uh, they will be able to take the uh, biopsy of uh, normal skin cells, uh, prepare uh, the area um, on the patient uh, where they have the white patch um, by dermabrasion or laser, and then uh, move forward uh, with spray on skin cells uh, without going through the process manually. Uh, so basically uh, a nurse or physician assistant uh, can administer the uh, local anesthetic and, and do the dermabrasion or laser. The question about the example, you said it's pretty the right sort of patients in that case so in so far as recruiting patients um, these were at uh, patients who were stable again stable vitiligo lesions not growing uh, with dermatologists who uh, have 
practice in vitiligo, stabilizing that disease. Um, and uh, these patients uh, agreed to have uh, a lesion that was met a minimum criteria relative to size and half the lesion was treated with resell. Uh, the other half was treated with standard of care, which is just phototherapy. So insofar as de-risking uh, the trials, um, if you have a look at the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see a substantial number of patients as well as publications and presentations in both vitiligo as well as in uh, acute soft tissue wounds trauma. So uh, we're, we're very pleased with uh, where we sit from a risk perspective. Um, we very recently, January 1st of this calendar year, received a, a C code uh, from CMS. Um, that's the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid um, in the United States. And uh, that reimburses for outpatient uh, burns, outpatient trauma. It's uh, indication agnostic. So generally outpatients um, can uh, basically um, physicians uh, in the outpatient setting will get full reimbursement uh, for the use of the resell device. Um, ease of use, I, I've mentioned it, uh, and I'll not go into detail. Um, regarding the market opportunity, soft tissue reconstruction or trauma, um, just to give you a sense of, of the size, um, about four and a half million patients are present every year in the, uh, to the emergency rooms of uh, hospitals and with traumatic wounds that require attention. Um, of those uh, uh, over 140,000 um, require uh, skin graphing. So they are basically resell eligible. That gives us a total addressable market for the United States conservatively of a billion dollars a year. And uh, from our point of call, which will be um, a, a number of high volume trauma centers moving forward, in addition to the burn centers that we're currently selling into, 50% of those are co-located with level one and level two trauma centers. Uh, so we're anticipating around 65,000 patients a year treated uh, with uh, our direct sales force. Uh, giving us uh, a $450 million opportunity annually. Um, you can see our enrollment was very slow in the beginning of this uh, trial due to COVID. Uh, patients were uh, just really not uh, presenting uh, for, for the trial and it was difficult to recruit. Um, and then when things started to lighten up and COVID abated, um, we actually gained uh, six months on this trial. Um, recruitment went very quickly and we have 65 patients. They're, every patient is their own control. Um, so um, double that number for the sample size. And so far as the commercial opportunity, as I just mentioned, we've got, you know, the 136, 137 burn centers um, and 50% of those are co-located with level one, level two trauma centers. And we'll be adding to that 230 high volume trauma centers for that $450 million opportunity. Uh, with vitiligo, um, we're looking at one to two percent of the population um, of the United States uh, so far as incidents on an annual basis. Of course, there's a, a good deal of prevalence as well right now. So uh, a large subset of stabilized patients who cannot uh, attain repigmentation uh, upon approval, we will be the uh, first and only product. Uh, available to repigment stable vitiligo lesions. Um, so four and a half million patients, um, that's an average number depending upon which publication one reads, it's anywhere between 
three and six and a half million. Um, and so far as stable vitiligo patients, um, you know, this uh, presents a total addressable market opportunity of stable patients of about $5.2 billion a year. And uh, for us, we'll be going uh, to call upon the top 1,000 interventional dermatologists and plastic surgeons, and uh, that'll give us a serviceable available market of uh, about $750 million a year. Here you can see um, enrollment complete, uh, of course, and uh, from another study um, on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, you can see that uh, the, the lesion that was uh, control uh, is not repigmented and the lesion that was recell treated is, uh, is repigmented. It's darker uh, than the other part of, uh, of that individual's leg. Uh, that's because it's been treated uh, with UV light as well. Uh, just to touch quickly upon um, genetic defects, uh, we're looking, as I, as I mentioned, um, at epidermolysis bullosa, genetic defect, and then we're looking at rejuvenation. Um, the only difference, if you look on the left-hand side of the slide, that's the, uh, just a copy of the earlier slide that I presented for the normal resell process. Um, in this uh, future platform that we have where we're manipulating the cells, there's just one added step, and uh, that's in the yellow box where the skin cells are genetically modified. Corporate, um, just a, a quick look at a balance sheet. Um, I guess importantly, given the market conditions, um, at March 31st of this year, we, uh, we ended the year with uh, $95 million US. Uh, so we've got a, a good three years of runway. And uh, we've got 19 issued patents, 23 pending, even if only 50% of the pending patents actually issue, uh, we'll have very strong protection for the next 20 years on this platform. Um, here's a quick look at our uh, executive leadership team, uh, a lot of experience around the table and uh, very proud of what we've been able to do so far. Um, risk factors and disclosures, important safety information. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention and open it up to questions. Thanks, Thanks Mike. That was very interesting. Um, can I just ask, with the vitiligo, uh, when you are um, re you know, applying the, the the cells back to the to the depigmented skin, I noticed in that in that particular figure it was a it was a square shape, but vitiligo tends to be, you know, amorphous in the edges. So how how can you tailor the the application to suit the shape of the? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, what we're doing in the clinical trial, that uh, the randomized controlled clinical trial, as opposed to that earlier clinical trial that you saw that was, uh, that was a patient from a European trial. Uh, what we're doing is taking uh, a lesion that is um, at least a certain size, so it can be bisected and one half treated with basically control, which is uh, phototherapy and the other side of the lesion, not square box within the lesion, but the entire lesion uh, dermabraded um, or lasered uh, to pinpoint bleeding and then apply the spray just to the depigmented area. And then we'll be looking, it's pretty much binary. Is it pigmented or not? 80% uh, repigmentation is the success criteria as uh, agreed to with FDA. Just one, one more question. So, sorry. Um, one other thing was, did, you, did I hear you say that you have a indication agnostic CMS code that has yes. been already granted? So yeah, that's for outpatient. So could would the vitiligo come under that? No, okay. No, no, that would only be for hospital outpatients. So oh, it would okay. apply for burns and for soft tissue wounds. The vitiligo is going to be an office based procedure. Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks for that. I just wonder if you can talk us through just the the ramp up of the product uh, in terms of the acceptance by the medical practitioners. How, how does how do you see it working, and 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 what do you need to do to to gain acceptance, and and, and how would the ramp up, you know, t- in time wise, would you envisage uh, w- w- would actually work? Is it is it sort of an area where it's you think people will be very conservative in adopting this product or rapidly? Could you give some understanding of how that market dynamics would work? Sure, that's a, that's a, a great question. Um, in Burns, um, where we're already approved, uh, we're finding that the younger burn surgeons, newly minted ones especially, are very, very quick adopters of the technology. Uh, they love it. And whenever there's a patient that needs skin grafting, uh, resell as part of the treatment, uh, if not all of the treatment. If it's a second degree burn, we only require resell. Um, in uh, trauma, uh, which is yet to be approved, uh, the, the trauma surgeons think about wounds a completely different way than the burn surgeons do. Burn surgeons are thinking about total body surface area, 10% or greater. Uh, so that would be a leg or a back, a full back. Trauma surgeons uh, think about anything the size of about a walnut or larger. And do they want to actually stitch this up? Um, or do they want to take a small skin graft or would they rather apply resell? And there's a lot of excitement uh, relative to resell coming to market. And uh, I think a, a good indicator of uh, future adoption is how quickly that trial enrolled um, after uh, COVID abated. In vitiligo, there is a pent up demand uh, for a repigmentation solution, nothing approved yet, and more products coming out to stabilize vitiligo, giving us more stable patients. So for example, Pfizer, um, AbbVie, and Insight Therapeutics all have JAK inhibitors that are being developed uh, rather than for cancer. Uh, These are being developed for stabilizing autoimmune disease, including uh, vitiligo. Um, So we've got some good wind at our back. Conferences and things like that as well. How much do you have to do in terms of that as well? Yeah, definitely. We've been at the American Academy of Dermatology already and have had dermatologists uh, presenting on uh, vitiligo. Um, and we're at all the burn conferences and uh, trauma. So, yeah, we, we definitely have a presence. There was a question from the audience online while well, we send the microphone over there about how durable the treatment is for vitiligo, as in. Yeah, um, great question. Uh, it was on uh, how durable is the treatment uh, for vitiligo? And uh, the answer is, as far as we know, it's uh, one and done, a single treatment. Um, so we've followed patients uh, for five to seven years, and it is durable as long as the autoimmune disease is remains stable, is not reactivated. Um, of course, if it is reactivated, then those melanocytes uh, will uh, get inhibited again and the white patches will, will come back. But um, assuming that uh, disease remains stable, it seems like it's a one and done. Uh, Mike, uh, I must admit, I haven't followed the stock for quite a, quite a while. Um, and I've noticed that the share price has been going, looks like in one direction in the last 12 months or so, what factors have caused that? And are those factors being overcome or what what measures are in place to try and make sure they don't happen again? Yeah, unfortunately, great question. Unfortunately, uh, it's really uh, macro uh, environmental and economic issues uh, that have caused the stock to fall. Um, we're trading right now at an enterprise value of about one and a half times revenue if you take our cash out. And um, there are well over 140 uh, biotech, medtech stocks that are listed on the NASDAQ that are trading below cash of negative enterprise value. So it's inflation, it's increased interest rates, 
um, it's the war in the Ukraine, Russia, um, those types of things have influenced the market and basically a lot of money uh, that normally flows into growth stage healthcare companies, as well as growth stage tech companies um, has, uh, has left. Um, but I do anticipate as do all the analysts and bankers uh, that this is a cyclical thing, it will come back and we're in good shape because we have the cash to sustain the storm and continue heads down, working, gaining approval, uh, gaining market share. And uh, that's that's a ticket for us. On the world, on from that, what would it take you to be like cash flow break even? Like what? So we haven't given uh, that as guidance. Uh, but what I what I can tell you is on a on a direct cost basis, um, we are already profitable in the Burns business, um, and the other businesses are represent multiples of the Burns business. The Burns business is about a two hundred million dollar market um, in the U.S. And for traumatic wounds, as I said earlier, we're looking at four hundred and fifty million. That's Avita only direct sales. Um, and for Vitiligo, we're looking at seven hundred and fifty million dollars a year, just with again Avita direct sales. I'm just wondering how you compare with Polynovo, and you know whether you feel there's sort of room for for both of you in the market. Thanks. Um, question was how do we compare with Polynovo? Polynovo is a dermal substitute, um, fully synthetic. Uh, we are complementary. Uh, to Polynovo's BTM product, we're complementary to Integra, any extracellular matrix. Um, I know that it, it works with BTM um, because physicians have, have used it that way. Uh, we also know that it works with Integra's uh, matrix. Um, but basically, if you've got a deep wound that's going into the dermis, uh, we are the upper coat, we're the epidermis. Um, we do not claim to be a dermal substitute. So you need to use either a synthetic um, or uh, animal derived product and then put resell. Uh, on top of that, interestingly, um, if you put it on top of a product that is not alive, is a cellular um, and as a synthetic, then um, the cells won't live. Um, because they don't have blood supply um, at, uh, or any nutrients, right? So uh, what we can do, uh, very interesting, can spray resell directly on the wound, uh, put a dermal matrix on top of that, dress it, and as it heals, uh, the act actually the uh, epidermal cells will migrate to the top. Um, and they know how to do this just based on biology. And uh, so it works out just fine. Any other questions from the, uh, from the audience or online? I'll ask one last question. For the um, lysis bullosa, it sounds like that's a full body condition. Does that mean you would have to essentially remove the skin from the entire body to treat it? Actually, no. Um, the, the skin, uh, unfortunately, because it's not adherent, the epidermis is not adherent to the dermis, um, it actually sloughs off. And uh, these, in, in the worst case, recessive dystrophic ED, um, children only live to about two or three years of age. Um, if it's a less penetrating genetic defect, then they'll live to you know, um, early uh, adulthood. But what happens is the skin sloughs and in areas that the skin has sloughed off, you basically can spray on and then you wait for other areas to slough and you've got donor sites. And um, we can take a, a disease that is lethal, deadly and has no treatment available and uh, we can potentially cure it. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I think that uh, um, that brings the formal part of, uh, of this evening's uh, session to a close. Thank you very much for everyone who's attended.
in person or uh, or online. Um, and thank you very much for FB Rice for hosting. Um, I believe the recording of this will be available on uh, Monsoon's YouTube channel. Um, and uh, with with no further ado, I think this refreshment's being served outside. So I encourage everyone to uh, stay and, and enjoy those as well. Thank you very much.